Go ahead. Good morning, equestrians. This is Mike Nicodema with Greenberg Traurig's Equine Industry Law Group. Today we're coming to you from the Global Showgrounds in Wellington. We have a very special guest today. This lady needs no introduction, but I'm going to give her a big one. Uh -oh. And we have a great show because she's a great guest. And those of you who follow us on YouTube or on social media know that I say this every time, but I mean it because at the legal standard we aim to please. This lady is a true icon from the showgrounds in Wellington to the showgrounds in Lake Placid to everywhere in between. She is a master of equine chiropractic care. She is a true spiritual leader and healer. And with her husband, David Lundquist, they own Equiline Chiropractic right down the road in Homeland. You know, we live in well Welly World where everything is two miles from everything else and cocktails are five o'clock p.m. sharp every day. Those of us who um, have the privilege of having our horses cared for by these folks just know them as Wendy and Dave. And today we have Wendy with us. Without further ado, how about a nice big Wellington welcome for Dr. Wendy Korn. Well, thank you. That was very lovely. And yes, embarrassing. <laughs> but it's okay. It's okay. It's, it's from love. And by the way, Wendy's not only been my friend for 20 years, I've been her patient for 20 years. So this is very special for me today. So why don't we get into it? Because I know you got a busy schedule, Doc. So, you know, most people know about, uh, have been to chiropractors for themselves, for humans. But unless you're an equestrian, unless you're a horse owner, it's not so intuitive about how to how to, to give a chiropractic adjustment or chiropractic care to a horse. How do you do that? Carefully. <laughs> Carefully is the number one answer because they're a lot larger and most, you know, when you're dealing with a uh, 1,200, 1,500 pound animal, there's a lot more safety precautions, although humans are infinitely more dangerous to work on than, you know, as a practitioner. When you're working on a horse, the important thing and the critical thing is to introduce yourself and have them allow you into their world to touch them because it really is a communication when you're doing a chiropractic adjustment. It's evaluating by hand and, and horses, as for all of you who have anything to do with horses know, they can love touch. They do it with each other. You put two horses together, they're out grooming each other. So being invited into their world and then assessing and understanding, can they move? Can they move comfortably? Where do they resist? And then each and every articulation in the horse can be moved from a stock to a mobile position. It, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I've seen you do it a hundred times. I've seen Dave do it a hundred times. Like a human can tell you, ouch, this hurts, or this is working, this is not working. How does the horse tell you? Oh, actually, horses are more accurate in their communication. Humans say, ouch, whether it hurts or not, because they think perhaps maybe it'll hurt. With a horse, there's a lot of signs. First of all, the worst sign is biting and kicking because they can do that. But typically, you'll see a twitch in the ears. You'll see a paniculus response, which is a worm-like response along the skin that lets you know there's been irritation there. There's eye contact. You know, there's, there's the evil eye, the same ones that your mother may have given you when you did something. <laughs> Horses are really, really good at informing you. We, we always say when we work on a horse, we like, we like to focus locally, but pay attention globally. Okay. Okay. Now, this is not dealing with a 185 pound human. This is a 1200, 1300, 1500 pound animal. You know, if you haven't been kicked by a horse, you've never owned a horse. How do you protect yourself when you're giving a horse chiropractic care? Yeah, I mean, that's, it's a really good question because it's common sense, which is, as you know, very not common. So the closer you are into the horse, the less likely you're going to be damaged. If you stand two feet away, that leg can come out and kick you. If you're up against the hip, you can't be kicked. You can be hip checked, but that's not really dangerous. So it's having that awareness. Always being present is how you stay safe. I have been bitten when I thought I was present, you know, so it's, it's that absolute ability to keep your awareness on that animal, know when it's about to doing something and get out of the way before it can. Uh, we've had horses that like the taste of you, so they're going to nip you on the way out no matter what. But in terms of actually being 
hurt, it doesn't mean that they're mean. It's not the bad horses that kick you. Sometimes they're just exuberant. Sometimes there's a fly touching them when you happen to be there, which is why there's rules. There's rules, ergonomic rules for practitioner of standing properly, having proper attention. And, and that's one of the, um, my favorite things to teach because keeping people safe is critical. Now, now, the last time I saw you, you used this tool on me, this metal tool, and you have one with you? I love show and tell. It looks like a shank, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's for fascial release? Yes. Do, do you, why don't you explain, explain to our audience how you use that on humans? Have you used it on horses, too? I use it on horses. I never use it on humans unless I like Well, use it on me. I, I mean... know. Well, you're, you're a little special. <laughs> but using fascial tools on horses is possibly the best informative tool that you can use. I can lightly move the superficial layer of skin and they can twitch up here. So it oh. will tell me where the lack of glide is. And sometimes I can be doing it on the cervical spine and you can see a twitch at the hip because, and to get nerdy with you, there are many lines of fascia that run throughout the entire length of the horse. And this has mm. been um, observed in dissections done by Eldebron and Schilke, uh, and they're brilliant. And I've attended their conferences, and you see this, and you can see that, why do we have diagonals? Well, there's a line of fascia that runs from right front to left hind. So I can use my fascial tool over our, our right shoulder, and it can twitch in the left sacroiliac, and I can know that there is a primary reason for something not moving by listening to the fascia. Wow. It's like a GPS. Okay. GPS, it looks like a shank. <laughs> yes, and I actually traveled. I got back from Iceland this, yesterday, and I was able to travel with this, and, and the TSA didn't take it away from me, so I was very pleased. What was going on in Iceland? Was that vac vacay, or it, what was going on It was on a little, it was a rehab uh, for myself and okay, for Dave, and good. we just... You know, sometimes you have to take care of yourself in order to take care of others. So, Because I knew you were going on a trip, and I knew... But would... I knew that I'd see an Icelandic horse, and I knew that I would have to do something if and I you did. did. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. Just one of those things. So how about the riders? You know, riders, they, they have this amazing skill. You see it in the ring. But a lot of times, they don't take care of themselves. And, it's, you know, especially... They're not in the gym. They're not... They think because they're riding four, five, six horses a day, that's oh. enough. And I know you do a lot of performance care with the riders. Unfortunately, yes. I thought I was giving up humans when I went equestrian, but the number one reason for horses not moving correctly is the rider. And there's a course that I actually have taught at vet schools, and I'm about to teach again, called Human Induced Equine Imbalance. And it doesn't matter if you're an Olympian or a backyard rider, the horse and you are one entity, and an equestrian is a horse and a rider, not a person on, on an athlete, but they are both the athlete. So if a rider is on their forehand, that horse is carrying more weight through its shoulder, it's not going to be able to engage its hind end. There's going to be rigidity in the patterns which show up somewhere, and you never know where because everything causes everything. Um, humans who ride and use riding, even stall walk, because I, I have a um, video that I do on how to muck stalls correctly. Because if you do it and use your top line, mm. then you're actually building strength and getting more sound. If you do this and only use your pecs and your biceps and never your lats and your triceps, then eventually you are going to look like Uncle Saul from Miami. <laughs> Sorry, Uncle Saul. That's fine. But that's, it's real, you know. And I have worked with so many Olympic riders where I'm like, I know you're phenomenal and I know you're winning. And if you do this and just change your dynamics, your horse is going to go better. That's interesting. So you, 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 you do with me. I mean, you can tell when you have a patient, when you have a rider, what's going on and what dynamics you have to work with. Same thing with the horse, but they work as a unit, right? Yes. Have, do you, as part of the practice, as part of the care, do you watch the rider on the horse? 
either at the walk or in competition and say, okay, now I know what's going on? Occasionally. Okay. Occasionally, and I haven't found it really necessary. Okay. The biggest cue is you go into a bar and you have six horses, they all have the same problem. I say, ah, perhaps it's the rider. Or perhaps you're not really, you're taking a saddle from horse to horse to horse and it's not fitting. Or the issue of the rider has deformed the saddle and now you're taking that, de you know, defor deformation, putting it on a horse and creating a pattern. So we'll read the situation mm -hmm. to, in order to determine who's the bigger culprit. And, and it's really interesting because the better the horse, the more it absorbs the issues of the rider, the better the rider, the more they take on the issues of the horse. And so you can actually tell who rode whom if you know them well enough to know who rode the horse by what's wrong with it or what horse the rider rode. And Dave and I did this at um, Equine Affair one year where we took, I took four riders and he took four horses and we evaluated them and we were three for four and the fourth one had flipped coming out of the trailer. So the issues were not rider horse, but oh. trauma. Wow. So it was, it's really, it's like, like I said, it's paying attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, this is not, you know, one plus one equals two. It's like with chiropractic care and, the, you it's know, one N plus equals one equals one. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's wow. N equals one. Every single situation is different. Yeah. And people, I, we were talking earlier, and people want me to name my technique. And, well, how do you do this? Fred. <laughs> There's no... Fred? Fred, that's the consummate name for okay. all things that don't need naming because it's it's very easy if and when you're first doing this as a chiropractor who is first coming out of veterinarian first coming out whether it's acupuncture chiropractic fascia work having a formula is good so that you actually have something to start out but getting locked into that formula limits you and limits the results you're going to get okay okay Let's talk a little bit about integrative uh, care, because I know you're a big proponent of, let's take the best of all worlds, put them together for, oh. a, for, a, for the right therapeutic result. Um, I, know you, uh, I know you deal with vets a lot. Every day. How do you do that? How do Easily. you integrate the two approaches with the common goal of, of, of you know, making the horse a better horse or well, making him more healthy? It, you know, the disservice, they did for chiropractic back in the human world is calling it alternative. And it's not an alternative to anything. Right. It is complementary. It is wonderfully complementary. If you're bleeding, do not come to me. I am not going to stop the blood unless it's my own, in which case, you know, I have all that. But the idea of it takes a village and people certainly in the competitive world know that we have, I have more vets as friends than any other um, profession because we love working together. Mm -hmm. It is not in any way an alternative. Same thing with dentists. I will tell inferiors, okay, my preference is before I touch a horse, make sure the feet are good, make sure the teeth are good, because nothing I do will last. Same thing as if it has, if I touch a horse and it's sore everywhere, I'm like, okay, it's systemic, call the vet. Do not, I'm not going to even touch it because sometimes you can actually exacerbate a systemic problem. I'm from Connecticut, Lyme. You adjust a horse with active Lyme, it's going to be more sore, more lame, more sick because you're increasing blood flow, you're increasing you know, circulation, all, and so the virulence of whatever they have is gonna increase. So you have to have a vet on speed dial. I have farriers on speed dial. I'll pick up a foot and go, hmm, where's your farrier going with this? And often we have, I had the most beautiful experience two months ago where we had the vet out, the farrier out, and us, and we were all sitting there going, what's best for this animal? And that, my nerdy brain gets so happy mm. because we don't have to agree, but we can all take in the data and go, how can we assimilate it and do what's, what's best for the horse? You know, I'm not a fan of camouflaging so that they can perform. Right. I'm, I'm a fan of you know, solutioning with people. Sure, yeah. You know, and, and part of the solution, I think, is, um, and we talked about this before, is, you know, you're the doctor, you're providing care to the horse, but it's on us, too, as, oh. the, as the riders, <laughs> the owners, 
we we're part of the equation. We how do we how do how do you counsel the clients to say, okay, I've done an adjustment on the horse, we've fixed the problem, let's keep it fixed. How do we help in that process? Oh my gosh. That is it's a brilliant question and what I bash my head against the wall with on a daily basis because we're there for moments of this animal's life. The owner, trainer, right, are there for the bulk of it. And it has to be, you know, a, a important amount of daily care. If a horse is out of its box for 20 minutes a day for going in a nine meter circle, there's no point in calling. I've told so many people, if you're not going to listen, just don't, don't call me because I'm just going to get upset. I am the Lorax. I speak for the horse. I, you know, if, we discuss that the saddle doesn't fit and you say but i love my saddle mm. my recommendation is take your saddle horse shopping find a horse <laughs> that fits under your saddle ride that one don't right. torture your animals so there's there's no simple answer but knowing your horse touching your own horse grooming your own horse looking for differences mm. you know because often there's so many um subtle changes before there's a catastrophic change so paying attention is really important. I taught a course um, in, in heavy COVID when we were hiding as much as possible um, called In the Meantime mm -hmm. for owners. And I, uh, the dog one was incredible because it's a lot of people, animal owners are more comfortable handling their dogs and they often delegate all of the handling of their horse. And I can tell you, I, Dave had this the other day, we go to treat a horse and it's lame, <laughs> pick up the foot, the shoe's on sideways, the, you know, nails sticking into the band, and you're like, perhaps this is why, you know, no one lifted the leg. So we tell owners, look, look, you know, yeah. ask questions. If you're not the hands-on person, get a, a daily report. What do you notice? You know, it's, it's not rocket science, mm -hmm. but it is a level of, can I see changes? You know, do I know enough? Are you comfortable asking questions? You know, and, and say, you know, what did you notice today versus yesterday? They need to move. They need to eat correctly. They need to be protected from things that are allergens for that specific course. I mean, there's so much that people can do. I got one for you. I was thinking about it over the, uh, the way over here. So, so one of the last times I saw you, you know, you can tell I'm crooked by just looking at me. You Correct. can tell that I have fallen arches, and that's a problem. So you made these great orthotics for me, and I love them. But I remember after you adjusted me, you said, oh, you got blood back in your face. When you walked in here, you were white as a ghost. Yes. Do horses give those kind of, like, does their coat look different? Does, how, do they give oh, those 100%. kind of visual signs when stuff's wrong? Yes. And as a matter of fact, just in palpating, you can feel that um, dehydration oh. because when you're touching the skin will stay up okay and that is a really dramatic sign of dehydration you get what we call that the paniculus because they have a recurrent laryngeal nerve that we do that inhibits this reaction horses don't so when you touch them and and there's something wrong you literally see them twinge away they used to call it back when i rode quarter horses you know that horse is cold back no, the horse isn't cold back. The horse is in pain, and it's telling you, and you just are choosing to ignore it. Right. Um, so there are signs like that. There's the eyes. The eyes reveal so much in a horse. You know, the difference in that squinty eye versus a comfortable eye versus the mm -hmm. wild eye, which will often give you signals of discomfort, dehydration. Um, I'm fortunate enough that our son is a veterinarian who also works mm -hmm. with us. He's got the Northeast. And he, because he's primarily an acupuncturist, along with chiropractic, he's showed us so many of the ways that feeling the meridian can reveal areas that are stagnant or are uh, too inflamed and too much flow. So the, if, if you're willing to learn, there's so much information out there. Wow. Okay. Um, you know, when, when, when a person is sick, like if I'm not feeling well, I know I'm not feeling well. You may not know what it is, but I'm saying, you know, I'm off today or something like that. How does, how does a horse owner know 
when they're looking at their horse, you know, I better take it to Wendy and Dave. We need some chiropractic help. Like, like what are the signs? The, the biggest sign is the horse is acting differently than it did the day before or okay. typical. That is the biggest. They don't want to go forward. They usually want to go forward. They don't want to turn one way or the other. They're less enthusiastic about going. It's, so it's really change. Is We like being the area of first when you, when you see something subtly wrong, we love checking that horse because we're going to go, okay, you just noticed the difference. Okay, here's what's going on. Oh, you can look at a horse, and if you put your fingers on their brow, mm. when a horse is off at the pole, your fingers will not meet. And that is a really big indicator. Horses that are head shaking, all of a sudden they don't want the bridle. They don't want to put their head down for the bridle. That's a reason... And again, we always check the teeth. I have had a lot of bloody fingers from sticking my thumb yeah, in yeah. And, and checking because that's something that we're going to check for you. When we come to look at your horse, we come doing a differential equation. Um, is this a chiropractic primary or is this a medical primary? Call the vet. Is this a, you know, a saddle, a foot, whatever. But the biggest thing an owner or trainer can do is notice a hesitancy you know mm. if they're walking the stall and, and digging while you're looking at a colic don't call us <laughs> please um, although getting them more comfortable helps prolong the time until the vet can get there and potentially save their life okay yeah you know it, it, it's funny because a lot of people think well you know it's always lameness you know that's the problem and yeah, it's, it's a, not, it's a right? misused word. Yeah. It's like telling people, tell me, oh, I have a ruptured disc. I'm like, really, do you have bilateral pain going down to your toes? No, it hurts right here. Then the odds are slim. You just like that diagnosis. So um, I always say, you know, naming things isn't necessarily um, accurate. So I'd rather call it an offness than a lameness. Lameness is veterinary. Lameness is a tear, a hole, a fracture, a that's that's the lameness. When they're just not right, we we'll call it an offness, and okay. then then it's appropriate to use complementary care. Mm. Now you mentioned colic, and that's a big deal. It's a big deal with horses. Are there is there any is that one of those things where chiropractic integrates with vets, or can you can you do anything uh, to alleviate? If it's a gas colic yeah. and you have the ability to put your thumb on the sac uh, sacro tuberous ligament, which is right by their anus, you can get the gas to release and you can stop it right then and there. And if you, you still call the vet, okay. you call the vet and do this in the meantime. And if they get there and say they're fine, that's wonderful, but I don't mess with it. Yeah. Um, I feel strongly that eating patterns and making sure that a horse is, has food access for more often than they typically do is your best prevention because horses are designed to eat all the time. They don't have cycles. They don't go have dinner and then breakfast. So making some way to give them the opportunity to have their digestive system working all the time is something that a rider, a trainer, owner, caretaker can do. And it isn't going to make obese horses if you do it correctly. Okay. Now, now when we look at something like chiropractic as a, as opposed to, you know, an internist or a vet or something like that, sometimes you hear the expression, the chiropractic medical art, the arts. I mean, mm -hmm. we want to make sure that, that, that the folks listening to this know exactly what chiropractic is. I mean, I know what art is because what I do, I'm a trial attorney and we say right. trying cases is an art. Yep. But there's also a ton of science involved in it too. Correct. It's an art, it's a science, and it's a philosophy. Okay. And the philosophy is? And the philosophy is structure determines function. Structure determines function. If okay. the structure lines up, it functions well. If the structure is disarticulated, it doesn't work so good. Okay. It's pretty simple, <laughs> Wendy. Okay. It is so simple. Chiropractic is so simple. It doesn't, it, it aligns. That's all that it does. It takes things that are restricted and it, creates mobility it's it is ridiculously simple but not easy and there's right. a very big difference between yes. simple and easy so when we talk about you know my chiropractic education so i've had a ridiculous amount of education um you know undergrad 
chiropractic grad school, post-grad school, two years of um, working. Then I've probably been to a conference a month for the first 20 years. And wow. now I go to the fascial conferences all over the world because I, I love learning and I love applying the science. And it used to be that we used animals for human science. And now we're using humans, especially in like kinesiology taping and fascial work. It's the humans coming over into the um, canine and equine world. Um, that's so incredible. And if someone I love, there is no other profession in the world where people say, I don't believe. No one says, I don't believe in dentistry. No one says, I don't believe in osteopathy. They say, I don't believe in chiropractic. It's not a religion. It's right. not a belief system. Right. You can choose not to use it. You can say, I don't like that experience. But when someone says it's, they don't believe, I'm going, I'm not Tinkerbell. So your yeah, belief exactly. does not affect my existence whatsoever. <laughs> um, and, and that's just... It's just amusing that that it got lumped into this when, you know, I've taken anatomy and physiology and microbiology and biochemistry and all of these things that have no value to my daily life whatsoever, mm -hmm. other than I know lots of big words. <laughs> now, top issues now, you know, you go to a lot of continuing education. What are the top issues now in the chiropractic world, especially in, in with respect to equine care? Wow, that's it's a good question because I don't think there is anything okay. that's a top issue because um, there is it hasn't changed in okay. the 42 years I've been in practice. It'll be 43 in January. It's still structure determines function. So it, there's a lot more add ons. There's a lot of shockwave and PEMF and stem cell and all of these things that have been added on to so that you can build your practice and get new patients and i think simple do a good job make a difference that's that's it so i personally at the seminars i go to are to learn a little bit more of what's going on under the surface because mm. i like to know yes but it hasn't changed anything i think there's something soothing about that it is that, that it's it like, hasn't oh, changed cool. because it doesn't have to change it doesn't have to change yeah. it's there's, there's nothing more to do other than, you know, understand, okay, now that I understand the fascia lines, I understand when I adjust the pole, why does that make the hind end better? Sure. As, as opposed to, well, okay, cool, it does. You know, yeah. But it, it hasn't changed my technique at all. Okay, Doc, now we're up to my favorite part. Okay. We're going to do three-word association. I pick words just for you. Okay. So I'm going to say a word one at a time. You tell me without thinking a lot. The first word that comes to your mind, you can embellish all you want after, after you do that. And here we go. The first word is nature. Nurture. Okay. The second word is patience. <laughs> I haven't any. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. Oh, no. I am an exceptionally impatient person. <laughs> um, I want results now. I want to do things now, and um, I want to understand a lot of things now in terms of the spelling of the word patience. So my, my brain immediately went to, well, there's too many of them, so let me talk about my patience instead <laughs> of those. All right, fair, fair enough. So the last one is, and I picked this one just for you, is intuition. Oh, and healing. Yeah, I mean... If it weren't for intuition, I don't think I'd be any good at what I do. I believe strongly that what intuition is, and I'm getting goosebumps, which which Wayne Dyer told me were, were God bumps. I, I thought that was kind of an interesting association. It, if you are intuiting something, I think you're taking in more data than your conscious mind knows you are. Mm. And then you are open to it and you can respond to it. So to me, intuition is the signature of a healer if they are intuitive you're going to get results and if they're um we call it vitalistic versus mechanistic and there are many people out there who are mechanistic they want the name of a technique they want to do it it's my and there are riders like that too i can only ride this horse you know where there's ones that are more vitalistic which means taking more information from the world around you and allowing it to assimilate and then use what's useful and uh don't feel bad about not using it all. Okay. Last question. Now, 
I know you're a teacher. I know you love to teach. You're a healer, but you're also a teacher. I know you've had interns in the past, and you have to juggle your practice with teaching young chiropractors how to possibly be you someday, a long someday into the future. <sighs> so if you have one piece of advice for someone who wants to be in your field, be an equine chiropractor, what would that advice be? Follow people around and find what's right for you. Learn from everybody. Do not, do not choose a guru. Choose advisors. Let all the data come in, and then when it resonates with you, that's the path to go forward. Have no fear. You know, I, I love that because I do the trial training in my, my law firm for the young lawyers, helping them become trial lawyers. And one of the first uh, talks I give them, I say, watch other people. Watch the lawyers who are trying cases all the time. Take what you like, put it in your pocket and use it. The rest of it just cast aside. Exactly. I think it's the same thing. It right? is ex exactly, goosebumps yeah. again. It is exactly the same thing. It's you find your you, and then uh, there was when I, I was teaching at seminars quite a lot in the past, and I found a box. I was driving down to uh, Asheville from yeah. New York, and it's a, a, a box that's plastic, and it looked like a shipping crate. And when you turned it on, it started shaking, and it said, let me out of here. And we use it as the analogy that, you know, if you put yourself in a box, all that does is limit your exposure to more information. So I highly recommend that you do not overly define yourself, that you know, have, have passion for what you do without limitations. Amen. <laughs> well, Doc, that's it. You did it. I can't tell you, Wendy, how appreciative I am. I know you got off a plane from Iceland. You did this for me. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> it was fantastic. We've been it's together fun. as friends, and I've been your patient for 20 years. I'm looking forward to the next one. Me as well. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. Look, Looking forward to the next edition of our podcast series, The Legal Standards, the GT's Equine Industry Group. Have a great day, and see you all soon.